Sure. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Good looking crowd out there. How are you guys? Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so uh, I, I met Chris over in the, the tax summit over in Phoenix. So I, he's out of Chicago, right? You guys are in Chicago? Uh, correct, yeah. Schomburg. Schomburg, okay. And we happened to sit in the same table together. Um, and we started talking and this was a topic that was very hot. So uh, after uh, meeting them at, in Phoenix, um, you know, I wanted them to speak today because it's, it's tax season, right? So everybody wants to know it's the hottest topic right now. Uh, but but uh, Chris, I, I can't pronounce the, the company name. It's, I don't know if it's Polish or what, but I, I don't want to say it wrong. So can you do a little introduction? Just tell, tell us a little bit about uh, your team and what you guys are doing. Sure, sure. So it's uh, it's Wochicki and Mulro. Sean Mulro, you could you guys might be able to see him on the screen or say something, Sean. I don't know if it's going back and forth. Oh, nice to meet you guys. Nice to see you. Got it. So a good good Polish guy, good Irishman out there. And then uh, we're uh, partners in a uh, small firm up in Schaumburg. We work on closely held businesses, closely held meaning small businesses. Probably our biggest client, maybe around fifty million in revenues. That's very rare. And then uh, typical client for us. Anywhere from five hundred thousand in revenues to three million, I'd say, is kind of our typical in there. And so we're used to, you know, five shareholders or less. Um, what that's done is that made us very savvy with uh, tax law in regard to small business and individuals. The entities we work with are pass-through entities. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but we're going to talk about them a bit today, and probably make some recommendations or at least try to plant a seed with you. But pass-through entities are. Uh, S corporations or partnerships or limited liability companies, and they're called pass-throughs because very often they file a separate tax return and the activity on those tax returns passes through to your individual income tax return. And this might be something that's uh, meaningful for uh, what you guys are doing in regard to crypto. We'll explore that a little bit as we go forward. Um, with that, we've been around uh, collectively for over 30 years, but the present firm with Sean and I, Sean just became a partner, but we've been whacking the ball at this for about 12 years now, so or 10 years, I should say. So it's our 10th year anniversary coming up uh, this October. So that's a little bit about the firm. Um, we're all local people here. So we have Cassie on the call. We have Logan on the call. And uh, I'm a DePaul University guy. And then I went to law school one block away at John Marshall High School was Weber High School on the Northwest side. So really never get out of the hood. So it was fun to be in Phoenix with uh, Jeff. So I, I don't think he's ever seen a man eat four plates of food before. So, but I, I got it done. <laughs> so with that, why don't I hand it over to Sean for a little bit? Sure. So uh, I know the, the point of today's call is to kind of touch on uh, tax crypto taxation. What we want to do is we're going to speak a little bit to it, but then also want to leave enough time for everyone to, you know, get whatever questions you guys may have answered. So we may be brief on the front end, but it's more just to give you guys opportunities to ask pointy questions or specific questions that you guys are looking for on the back end. So what I want to do is kind of give you guys a little bit of a high level um, on crypto taxation. So a lot of what's interesting about crypto is the fact that it, um, you know, they call it cryptocurrencies, but in the eyes of the IRS, it's, it's treated as property. Um, and with that, there's a few different caveats that we got to look out for. So you, you'd have your day traders or not even day traders where you're just buying and selling cryptocurrencies. And at that point, it's, it's relatively uh, straightforward where you buy a crypto, hold it for either a year or more or under a year, and then you get it with either short-term or long-term capital gains. Um, and if you were just strictly buying and selling, it's relatively straightforward in that regard. What becomes interesting is when you know you exchange one coin or token that you've held for for any period of time for another, and in that case you would think, hey, I don't got any capital gains or any any taxable income to report because one, I didn't convert anything into uh, U.S. dollar, and I technically don't think I sold my crypto. But in the eyes of the IRS, that truly is not the case. Um, they're treating any exchange of property as a taxable event, and a lot of people look back to uh, the code section 1031. So they're saying, hey, it's a like kind exchange. You guys may or may not have heard about that before, but you used to be able to exchange like kind property for each other um, to avoid any kind of taxable events. But the IRS and well, Congress got rid of that in 2018 with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act where they got rid of like kind exchanges outside of um, real estate transactions. 
So when you're exchanging one particular crypto for another, that's actually a taxable event that you got to keep your eyes out for. Um, and really what, what it becomes is a bookkeeping issue where you need to be um, tracking that for yourself, whether or not you're doing it manually, which is nearly impossible if you have a lot going on or using a particular software. So there's softwares out there like Taxbit. Uh, we like Coinly, Coin Tracker, and things like that uh, that we'd recommend that you guys look into. So I don't know the scope to which everyone here today is um, involved in the crypto world, whether or not you're, you're involved in different projects, whether or not you're just buying you know, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and whatnot, but there's other people involved in um, DAOs, uh, buying, buying nodes, doing different staking projects, things like that. That's where it gets really, really interesting in how the IRS is treating things. It's actually still evolving. Um, so we can talk a little bit about that today on um, in specifics, but um, what I want to touch on is that if you're doing any of those types of projects where, you know, you're, you're making nodes, um, you're mining, staking, those are those are considered, we, we consider those to be trader businesses. And the reason why we want to do that is there are going to be expenses related to those projects that are potentially deductible. Um, and we want you guys to be considered in a trader business in that, in that uh, project because we don't want the IRS deeming you to be treating this as a hobby. So if you just have a hobby on the side, say you're just baking cookies and you're selling them uh, to the neighborhood, the IRS may say, hey, you got a day job. This is truly a hobby for you. Um, you're going to recognize all the income from the sales of your products, but you're not going to be able to deduct any expenses. Um, and in our eyes, there is some uh, risk that the IRS may try to come in and make that determination to you for you later, where they see, hey, you got your job and you're just trading cryptos on the side. We're going to treat this as a hobby where you might have a, an expense for a mining rig or a node that you created that you could potentially write off. They're going to say, hey, this is a hobby. You don't get to write anything off, but all that income that you guys are receiving you're surely going to pick it up on your tax return. So one high level estimate that we're making for a lot of our clients is to set up an LLC um, to actually formalize the business for two reasons. One, to kind of create a step away from you personally from your crypto assets and uh, activity, but then also making an S corp election. Um, and what that is, it's a small business election. You make it with a form 2553. And effectively what that does is it helps shield you from the IRS's self-employment tax. So I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with that, but if you are a sole proprietor or a self-employed individual, what the IRS does is on top of your regular ordinary income tax, they're going to hit you with an additional 15.3% tax for self-employment tax. And effectively high level without getting too far into it is them trying to replace the social security and Medicare tax that would typically be withheld from an employee's W-2. Um, and with that, um, having the S corporation, you're not subject to that additional tax. There are some additional steps you have to take. You have to file an additional small business tax return. So it's an 1120S and you have to have a reasonable salary out of the company. So you'd have to be um, filing quarterly payroll tax returns, but if, depending on how much you're making, you could be saving thousands of dollars a year in tax. So there are thresholds and we can kind of get into that um, in more specifics, but from a high level, that's, that's kind of the route we've been going. Um, to try to avoid taxation on these things, just because from a very basic concept here. So mining, um, anytime a reward hits your wallet, it's te technically ordinary income to you. Same with any kind of node in which you're claiming rewards, that's ordinary income to you, not going to be just capital gains when you sell the asset. Um, and the same could have been said about staking uh, up until last week. So um, you know, Logan, you want to touch base on that case that just came out. So there, so part of the reason why we say it's ever evolving is that there was actually a case that just came out, or, uh, well, last week, and it's actually still ongoing with uh, staking rewards. So Logan, I'll let you touch on that. Yeah. So I don't know if anyone heard that last week, where a couple in Tennessee challenged that since they, uh, the staking rewards, they, it was like. The whole idea of it being non-taxable until they sell it, whereas um, up until then, it was, as soon as it hits your wallet, it was taxable, where people were like, oh, it's unclaimed rewards, all that kind of good stuff. And then, uh, I'm sorry, hold on. I can't, it's like reverbing right now. Got it. Not getting that on my end. Um, I hear wrong. myself twice in my ear. 
all right, I'll let you work on that and I'll, I'll kind of finish up on it. Um, so what happened is the, so because the IRS is treating cryptocurrencies as property, um, the argument was, hey, this is taxpayer created property. And in any other kind of situation like this, it's not taxed until you sell it. So the big examples in there were, if you actually had a gold mine, so you're, you're, you go into the mine and you, you go and uh, pickaxe for some, some gold and you come out with some gold, you're not taxed on that as you walk out of the mine. It's not until you exchange that for money for cash that you are taxed on that. Um, so they're, they're kind of putting that same thought process into this where they're saying, hey, I, these staked coins are just creating new taxpayer uh, created property. So it shouldn't be taxed until I sell it or exchange it for another coin because they, the IRS isn't going to budge on that. So if you take your, your, I don't know if anyone's in any kind of DAOs, but just say a Hector DAO where you're staking coins um, and you pull that money and exchange it for Ethereum, they're going to tax you at that point. This, that doesn't shield you from that piece, but if you were to just stake and you just hold your coin over and over again, what to, to until last week, you know, a lot of people in the field were thinking, hey, all that's going to be taxable. And the unfortunate part is you're going to have to liquidate some of your, your investment to try to pay your tax. Um, and part of the issue there was the wherewithal to pay your tax where you don't actually have the cash to pay it. And this potentially helps solve that. Um, how it's kind of the state of the case right now is that the IRS was actually going to issue a refund to these folks. They had 8,000 of income from, from staking. So they were requesting a $3,000 refund or so. Um, and the IRS was willing to issue them that refund. But what they did and actually, which is pretty good for the rest of us is they refused that refund. Um, and by refusing it, they said, I want more guidance. I want to, want to, to take this to tax court to create precedent moving forward. I don't want to be taxed on this moving forward. So now there's the court date set for March of 2023. So there probably won't be any resolution on that over the next year, but it's kind of light at the end of the tunnel for us where potentially the staking rewards aren't going to be taxable until you actually liquidate it or at least exchange it for a different coin. So you have a little bit more control on when that taxable income is going to hit, um, hit your income tax return on that end. So that's one of the big things there. Um, Chris, you got something to say? Yeah, and I got and just we'll we'll a lot of tech stuff, so we'll give these guys a, a breather for a second, and I'll do I'll do my famous scare tactics on this thing. Not really scare tactics, but just want to brief you guys on a uh, a couple things that you probably already know. But we got the uh, with the IRS. Well, let me let me start this way. We've we've had a lot of phone calls where uh, people have called their tax preparer and the tax and they're saying, "Hey, we got into crypto in 2021," and their tax preparer freaks out and they uh, they won't do their tax return. So. We're stepping up, we're doing tax returns out there, and we're learning the law as we go. And this thing's the wild west again, because much like Sean was describing, the law is unsettled. So everybody's doing the best they can. And we've probably got 70 crypto people like yourself, and not a single one of them has looked to cheat or avoid tax. Everybody wants to step up. They say, hey, we're doing well with crypto. We want to do the right thing. I want to pay my fair share to the IRS, and I want to do it the right way. And so that's so we applaud you guys for that. We applaud everybody that's in crypto. Everybody's stepping up in that regard. That said, we're doing the best we can because the law is not settled and some things are going to change. So one of the things that's going to happen is it's one of my favorite things to say is in this uh, in this country, you could kill a man and you're innocent until proven guilty. Tax law is the exact opposite. You're guilty until you could prove yourself innocent. So the record keeping burden and the reporting that you guys do in a tax return, the burden is on you. If you don't do it, the IRS could come in and they just say, we think you made this much and you don't get any expenses and you owe us tax plus penalties and interest on this thing. If you willingly fail to report, that could be considered fraud and then you got a big problem. So we have some people, most people seem to have really jumped into the ring in 2021 and they're doing the right thing. There's some people in 2020 that were doing some crypto and they didn't report it on their tax return and are asking what they should do. And we're making the recommendation, you should go back and report it. There is a materiality issue there. I mean, if it's very de minimis, don't worry about it. But if you had some substantial transactions in 2020 and didn't report them, it might be best to report them. So we have a new administration that's in office and we've all watched uh, President Biden's act struggle, the Build Back Better Act, but it's packed with crypto stuff, not with solutions, but with, hey, go get them, we need the money. Um, that act in there has 89 billion 
segregated for or allocated to the IRS to conduct audits. And one of their big audit programs is Operation Hidden Treasure. So they're going to go out and they're going to go look for crypto guys. And you guys probably know that they did John Doe subpoenas to the big exchanges like Coinbase and Kraken. And what they did with these John Doe subpoenas is they said, hey, tell us anybody who had transactions over $10,000. And so now they're starting to get lists and we could see the, the dawn of regulation coming upon us. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe it's a bad thing. But again, back to the Wild West, we're in the pioneer times right now. And there's no regulation. Everybody's got a different definition. The SEC has a different definition than the IRS. The Federal Trade Commission has a different definition than both of those parties. So everybody's on a different page and we're vulnerable. And all we can do is the best we could do on this thing. So I just wanted to get that out there that, uh, you know, we're here to help. Everybody seems to be doing the right thing but want you to be aware that there's ambiguity. One last thing too, as we're doing our studies on this side and getting continuing education, this problem may solve itself a little bit. So much like you have an E-Trade or a TD Ameritrade account and you get a brokerage statement at the year end, a tax statement, a 1099 it's called, we think those are forthcoming, maybe as soon as 2023. I'll see it when I, I'll believe it when I see it. But, uh, but at least in the next two or three years, which will help this. But in the meantime, I've always been preaching that we have a bookkeeping problem right now because as we get into different things, and I know Logan and Cassie and Sean are going to talk more about the different swim lanes, as I like to call them, um, there's, the, the regulation is loose on it. So all we can do is the best we could do when we go forward. So bookkeeping is a big problem, and I encourage you guys to start now if you haven't started. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, I think. So I'll be quiet for a while. I just wanted to get that out there. Sure. So, um, yeah, I don't, Jeff, on your guys' end, if you guys start getting questions, feel free to send them up. I'm just got two in here in the the Zoom chat that um, we'll just hit now as we continue on, and then we'll continue on with the with the discussion here, because um, we really do want this to be back and forth. We want you guys to get the questions answered that you want, as opposed to us just talking at you. So, if you have particular questions, let us know, and then we'll continue on. Um, so I, I do see a question in here where it said, so for 2021, will we be taxed on staking any, even if we continue to restate? Um, so the problem with that is that there is no precedent set by the IRS yet, or even Congress or, or uh, the court. So that's a position that you potentially could take. It's all a risk tolerance at this point. Um, you know, everyone in the CPA profession or the field that we're looking into crypto taxation um, up to this point, thought staking would be taxable upon receiving your wallet, just the same way that, you know, at the end of the year, if you're running a small business and you're a cash basis taxpayer, you might receive some checks on December 31st and say, hey, I'm not going to cash them until the first to avoid being taxed on this, uh, this money until the following year. But the IRS is going to make the argument that you've constructively received this money and the only thing from stopping you from taking it is actually hitting claim and changing that into U.S. dollars. Um, but, you know, obviously they were willing to issue a refund on this, whether or not they were just trying to get these guys off their back, or if they, um, are actually going to go down this route of not taxing staking at this point is unclear. It's a position that you can take. Um, we're not, uh, particularly recommending it or not recommending it at this point. You got to have a discussion, um, with whoever's preparing your tax return, your CPA, um, and, and talk about the risk associated with that. And then you got to monitor the case because if it goes the other way, then you're going to have to go back and amend your tax return and pay any penalties and interest for, for late payment taxes at that time. So it may be better to pay the taxes and go back and get it later, but who knows how long it would take the money to get the money back from the IRS. So unfortunately, not a solid answer on that right now um, because it's just evolving as we, as we speak on this thing. So um, hope that answers the question there. Did you see the rug question that just came in? Yes. So we'll get to that one. So we got next question. Okay. We've got, um, is it too late to apply for S Corp or LLC to avoid additional taxes for 2021? Um, yes, unfortunately. So the IRS is going to know when your LLC started. Um, so if you created an LLC today, um, they're going to they're gonna know that your LLC started on February 8th, 2022. So there's no way for you to backdate anything, um, but I would recommend you do it as soon as possible for 2022. The other option is if you happen to have an LLC already set up that um, maybe you didn't make your S-Corp election in, you could always do a late 
S Corp election, there is relief from the IRS on that. So just do that before you file your tax return. There are very specific steps you need to take and language that need to be included in with these late S elections. So if you're not already working with the CPA, I'd recommend you find one or we're happy to help as well um, in that regard. Um, it just shows a very you know, standard procedure by the IRS, but if you don't follow it to a T, they're gonna deny your S election and then you're, you're out of luck. Sure, and just, just for curiosity purposes for the audience we could see, who, would you raise your hand if you have an LLC? A lot of you guys. Would you keep your hand up if you made it an S corporation? Okay. Yeah. And then how many of those LLCs are single member LLCs? Like not the S corporations, but single member LLCs. Okay. So we're not, we're, Sean and I, there's nothing wrong with a single member LLC. And a, a lot of this taxation with the exception of an S corporation is the exact same thing. So if you did nothing and you're a sole proprietorship, you didn't set up an entity, that's X the same as a single member LLC is gonna be taxed. So a single a sole proprietorship ends up on schedule C of your individual income tax return. So does a single member LLC. And we don't like schedule C, even before crypto, the IRS notoriously audited schedule C because that's where a lot of people put hobbies. And that's, that's how this whole hobby concern came up on this thing. So one of the recommendations is we want to create a separate tax return. Again, what Sean talked about was that separation of you personally from your trade or business, your crypto trade or business is what we're looking to accomplish on this thing. So something to consider if you're a single member LLC, it's fine to have that entity. It's for limited liability protection, which is hard to foresee. Um, but maybe consider making that an S corporation. And we could talk more about that. Absolutely. Um, Jeff, we got a couple other questions in the, the chat here on Zoom, but I don't want to miss out on anyone in person that had any questions. Anyone in person have any questions? Yeah, we have some questions. Uh, my question, is there any, is there a benefit to opening up an LLC in uh, Wyoming or Delaware compared to Missouri? Sure. So we get that a lot. So Wyoming and Delaware, they, they have better um, privacy rules and maybe some corporate protections, but from a tax standpoint, um, no, there is not because it, the crypto is going to be taxed in the state where the trader business is being operated and that business is being operated by the individual trading or buying the cryptocurrency. So it's going to come back to you personally. Um, so whichever state that you're living in. So we have individuals that have different needs for why um, they, they would like their privacy didn't, you know, to not show up on the secretary, secretary of state website. Um, and if that's something you're desirous of, those states could potentially be a solution. But from a tax standpoint, um, no, there's not a lot of reason to do that because it, inevitably you're going to have to register your, your Wyoming LLC as a foreign entity or foreign corporation in your home state, regardless to file your um, home state. So in this case, Missouri tax return for the corporation, but then also for you personally, because you're going to get taxed in the state that you're operating in. Uh, you know, which a long time used to live there, loved that city, moved to St. Louis. Uh, gr great to have the tether back. The uh, question I had was, did you mention in that court case that it was Nashville? So Tennessee is where that decision and process of the uh, mm -hmm. people in their crypto situation currently was, is, did you say Nashville? Um, I believe, believe so. Logan, what's the, I know it's Tennessee. Uh, um, yeah, it's Tennessee. I don't know. I, I think it is Nashville. Uh, we can and it was on, yeah, it is. It's Nashville, Tennessee. And, and are there any, um, uh, legislators that are jumping in there from Tennessee that are providing perspective? Not that, not that we're aware of. I mean, we, from our standpoint, we're seeing that, um, the court is kind of just running with this and, um, uh, Right now, really, these, this couple is, you know, pushed back on their own, which is actually really good for the crypto community. But no, I, I haven't seen anything from a, a legislator side of things on this. Um, so it may be worth, I mean, if we, you know, your local legislation and all that to, uh, to push back on this as well. I mean, it's always encouraged to do that, to encourage your uh, legislators and all that to, you know, vote and pass things for crypto friendly uh, laws here just because it's so new that a lot of these guys are just scared about it and they don't even know that their uh, patrons even care about it. However, this this case is a federal case too, right? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. 
Another question we just, have. Can you talk about uh, thresholds to go to from LLC to S Corp? Because I know probably at a certain income level is your threshold. So I know there's extra fees involved with setting up and keeping up with an S Corp. Sure. So um, there's not a specific number. I mean, once you're making, I don't know, forty to fifty thousand dollars in profit, um, and this is ordinary income profit, that is, um, it, it probably makes sense because, like you said, there's additional fees with an S corporation. You have to file a corp or an annual corporate income tax return. You have to file quarterly payroll tax returns, and then also you have to pay yourself a reasonable salary. So even say you made um, thirty thousand bucks, um, the self-employment tax on that would be um, 4,500 bucks or 4,600 bucks. So you'd say, hey, that's a, that's a good amount of tax savings in itself. Um, but you have to file a corporate tax return. So depending on who's doing it, it may cost anywhere between 1,000 to 1,500 bucks. So that takes off $1,500 of your savings already. Your payroll is gonna cost you about 1,000 bucks a year to upkeep. So you start to eat into that. And then your, your reasonable salary, if you pay yourself $10,000 out of the corporation, then because the IRS is gonna require some sort of salary, that's another 1500 bucks on it. So that's where you quickly get into the point where, all right, maybe I saved a couple hundred bucks with the extra headache. I'm, it's not worth it. But once you're 40, $50,000, at least, then it definitely makes sense as you, as you start to break those thresholds. That's where we typically start having those conversations with our clients. You know, and just something to add real fast too. And then if you're, if you're hitting home runs to uh, the Medicare tax never turns off. So we, we actually have a client that uh, is probably making five figures a month uh, pretty high five figures a month. And it's, it's a lot on this self-employment tax. So just for clarity purposes, in case you guys don't know, everybody's accustomed to income tax and you file your 1040. And if you get a W2 in there, there's uh, a line item on your W2, probably OASDI, which is social security. And then another line that says Medicare. And those are 6.2%. And the Medicare is 1.45%. And then the employer matches that. And when you put those together, those are 15.3%. So when you set up your crypto, crypto trader business, this is separate from income tax and you got to pay 15.3% before you even get to income taxes. So the S corp that Sean is explaining helps save on that 15.3%, sometimes substantially. Yeah, so the big thing yeah, is looking at it once you're making 30, 50, 30 to 50 grand is particular time where you could start looking at it, doing your own analysis on this saying, Hey, I, uh, you know, it might make sense to do that now. Um, any other questions in the room? <laughs> <laughs> um, so for someone who's just buying long-term and staking through DeFi uh, and doesn't do a whole lot of training or uh, uh, trading or mining, uh, are there any benefits at that point to start an LLC or go that extra step for an escort? Sure. So um, it becomes less beneficial just because there's not a lot of ordinary income there, especially if this staking piece uh, ends up not being taxable until you exchange it. Um, because then everything that's going to flow through on your tax return is going to be long-term or short-term capital gains. And so the way a pastor rent key works is that at the S-Corp level, it actually doesn't pay any income tax on its own. It passes through any profits back to you through a schedule K-1. And the K-1 will list out on it different boxes where it says, all right, line, line one is ordinary income. So this is from ordinary operations, you know, from a typical business that would just be operating either, you know, manufacturing company or whatever. But then crypto could be the same thing if you're in these particular areas of nodes, mining, things along that, things of that nature. But then other boxes on there, there's interest, dividends, and then you get to short-term and long-term capital gains. So it would just show on your tax return separately here's what your short-term capital gains are. Here's what your long-term capital gains are. And the short-term and long-term capital gains are never going to be subject to that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that self-employment tax. So um, from that standpoint, if that's primarily where you're generating your income is in capital gains, the S corporation doesn't have, have a lot of merit to it or the LLC, especially because there's not going to be a lot of deductible expenses related to that anyways. You're just going to create basis in your particular cryptocurrency and when you buy it. So if you buy something for a thousand bucks, that's your basis. And if you sell for $3,000 later, you have a $2,000 gain. You'd recognize that gain the same way if you were doing yourself or within an LLC and an S corporation. So from that standpoint, no, there's not a lot of merit for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can't particularly see who's raising their hand. So whoever wants okay. to 
to start to be no yeah. you had, okay. you had your hand first yeah for like uh, rewards cards that have uh, you know cash back or points i understand that they're not um taxable because they're considered a discount what about those cards that pay rewards in crypto are those um considered you know taxable or ordinary income um our understanding of that is that um, right now it's it's also not taxable. It's treated the same way as your rewards um, because it's coming from the credit card. Um, it's treated the same way there. There was a court case back in the day where crypt or credit card rewards are not taxable. And so that's falling under that right now. Will the IRS attack that? Uh, potentially, but from our standpoint, we don't, we don't see that as a taxable event right now. Then one uh, follow on question, if it's not taxable sure. and I swap and that I crypto for another currency, base. what is my basis? You're gonna have no basis. No basis, so that it's also a tax-free or a non-taxable event if I swap it into a No, no, I'm not no. So it's gonna be taxable at that point. Because you didn't pay any tax on it, there's no you have no basis in that reward that you receive. So if you were just say you never get whatever, just say you got one ETH, but that was your reward. There was no basis for that. And if you go and swap that for um just part of a Bitcoin, so ETH is somewhere around three thousand bucks, I think, right now. That would be three thousand dollar taxable event to you because now you had um, an attrition of wealth where you had this non taxable event, but now you were able to create that, use that, and go purchase another item worth three thousand dollars. So, and because you're exchanging it for another crypto, the IRS is going to look at that as a taxable event. You know, you want to? Oh, go ahead. You want to maybe drop in wash sales somewhere and so just talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so. I don't know, does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering what the tax I should reserve to pay when I do that swap. Like, let's say if I got $1 in, in, in the crypto reward of what it was worth at the time, and that's not taxable, and I exchange it for another coin that say it's worth $1.20, you know, what is my tax liability for that after the swap? Sure, so assuming you do it within a year, um, it's gonna be a short-term capital gain which is going to end up being a um, tax at ordinary income tax rate. So whatever your ordinary regular income tax rate is. Um, so 20, depending on your tax bracket and your other income, yes. that's where you'll end up. There's no beneficial rate for short-term capital gains rates. If you hold on to it for a year and then you do it, it'll be a long-term capital gain, in which case that the maximum capital gain is at 20%. But depending on your income, you could be capital gains of 0% or most likely 15 per, 15%. Um, and to touch on that, what Chris was mentioning, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are all with wash sales, but with, let's start with it just from a stock perspective. So what, what was happening back in the day is you get towards the end of the year and savvy investors would see in their stock portfolios, they've got long-term capital gains of $30,000, let's say. Um, and they have investments that they don't want to sell, but from the time that they bought them, they've lost just say 30,000 bucks. So if they don't do anything with it, they have unrealized losses in their account for $30,000, um, but they can't do anything from a tax perspective. So they pay $30,000 of, uh, well, not of tax, but they'd have to recognize capital gain of $30,000 on their other stock that they sold. So what these guys were doing is they'd say, all right, this particular stock has lost $30,000, but I haven't sold it yet. I'm gonna sell it today on December 31st. And I'm gonna buy it back on January 1st to recognize that loss, but then still keep my stock that I believe is still gonna grow. Um, and for a while, you were able to get away with that. But then the IRS implemented rules where they're saying, you know what, you can't do that. We're going to consider that a wash. So effectively, what you're trying to do is just wash out your losses to offset your gains. So any stock that you buy back within a certain period of time, I think it's 30 days after um, selling your stock, they don't let you recognize that loss. It actually gets added back to your, um, your overall gain. So then from a crypto side of things, you know, when it first started coming out, CPAs around, they're like, oh, wash sales are gonna apply, but really because it's separate properties and not a security, um, wash sale rules do not apply. So what you can do for now, the Build Back Better plan is trying to eliminate this. But what you can do is that if you have losses or if you have capital gains right now, um, and with the crypto market having, well, it's coming back a little bit now, but having just kind of taken a dip, where people at the bottom of that dip could have, you could sell your crypto and just buy it right back and you'd free up some of your losses to offset capital gains that you either have or may have in the rest of the year. So the wash sale rules are very, uh, very interesting. So it's definitely something you guys should keep an eye on. 
you know, if the Build Back Better plan passes as it is right now, then those wash sale rules will be eliminated. Whether or not they'll be backdated to the beginning of 2022, I'm not sure. Typically, you know, there's not a lot of backdating in tax laws um, until the past couple of years where everything's been getting backdated. So um, it's a good thing to keep an eye out and it's a good planning opportunity when you, when you realize that, hey, wow, I have a lot of capital gains, but now all my cryptos are down. Let me just sell them and buy them back. Of course, there's gas fees and all that, and fees associated with that. Um, but, you know, you may be able to save significant amount of taxes depending on your situation. I'm not saying blanket statement. This is something you should be doing. It's something to, to review in your, your account. You know, and while we're talking about losses, Sean, I'm going to have you talk about uh, getting rugged, if I'm saying it right. But before that, just a real quick survey um, with the audience that we could see. Who's Who owns NFTs out there? Anybody? Okay, a few guys. Those are taxed at a different rate. Those are considered collectibles. So there's some special rules that may apply to those. There's a couple types. And then uh, is and by show of hands, is anybody does anybody own nodes? And is anybody mining? Okay, so just a few, just to see what we got going on out there. Sean, you want to talk about uh, yeah, so we, um This is kind of flows into one of the questions on the, the Zoom chat as well. So is, what is your philosophy on crypto scam losses? Um, just form 8949. So the 8949 is actually where you just report, you know, capital gains or losses from the sale of cryptos. So depending on your uh, classification, whether or not you're within a trader business or if you're just a personal uh, trader, you know, those will get treated in different ways. I mean, there's potentially opportunities to treat it as some sort of a Ponzi scheme where you can get, actually get an ordinary income uh, loss on that. But at the very least, yes. I mean, I would write those off as a short-term capital loss at the very least. But the bad part about that is that capital losses are, are limited to $3,000 loss in excess of any of your capital gains. So if you have $10,000 of capital gains and then you have $50,000 of capital losses because you, you know, you got scammed. Unfortunately that year, you're only going to be able to write off $3,000. So um, there are potential opportunities to take more aggressive plays, such as the Ponzi scheme losses, or depending on the type of venture that you were involved in, um, to essentially get ordinary income tax losses. So um, kind of swings into the node discussion here. So with nodes, um, there was a handful of folks that were involved in that, but what you, what you do is you're actually um, paying for a node to be created and some of these nodes. So one of the bit main ones out there is the strong block nodes. Um, there was, there's Thor. Um, and one of the bad ones was ring um, where these nodes, you actually, you pay for them and there's no opportunity to sell them later. They won't let you lease them. They won't <laughs> sublease, sublease them. All you can do is pay your monthly fee to upkeep the, the node and, Keep getting your rewards, which is fine unless you wanted to get out. So right now, there's no opportunity to sell them. I know Strongblock is talking about potentially tokenizing these nodes and be able to sell them later if that's the particular one you're in. But right now, there's no opportunity to do that. So from, in our opinion, there's potentially an opportunity to write off the purchase of a node as a deductible expense. Whether or not you want to call it rent, a licensing fee, or franchise fee, it's somewhere where we're leaning towards. Um, but you know. There is risk associated with that. The IRS and Congress and tax courts have not made any any guidance on this. So we're kind of all the guinea pigs on this thing where the IRS or someone may lay the hammer down later and we'll have to amend later. But we're trying to make reasonable decisions based on the information we're provided with based on the prior tax law. So you got nodes, that's an opportunity there. So one of the bad ones was, well, I don't want to say bad because I don't know everything about it, but there were these ring nodes where um, whether or not they just poorly ran the project or they, they took the money and what Chris is referring to as rugging. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with that, but someone creates a token, locks up your ability to sell, and then uh, they pull out all the money and the value drops from whatever, you know, a thousand bucks down to zero in about a matter of seconds. Um, from that pers perspective, if you're in a node, you've already written off all that ordinary expenses from the ring ring nodes in particular, if you took this position. So there would be no additional loss to take because all your all your expenses were already deducted. But if you're just treating it as a capital asset and um, capitalizing that basis in whatever project that you're buying tokens or nodes or staking or, or whatever it may be, yes, you're gonna wanna write it off one way or the other. 
if, at the very least as short-term capital losses, but potentially even a little bit more aggressive on a Ponzi scheme or even as an ordinary ordinary loss if you can make the argument that you're in a trader business. So um, every situation is different and you got to just look at it and make a reasonable argument based on the facts because um, the IRS is probably going to ask you about it. They're going to look at crypto and you just got to be able to produce a reasonable argument. And then with that said, when we're talking about risk tolerance on this thing, um, everyone's got their own risk tolerance. And since all this is so new, the IRS doesn't even know what to do with it. Um, where you may want, if you have something like that, where you're taking an aggressive approach, there's what they, they call these disclosure statements on your tax return that you could file with your return where you tell the IRS, hey, here's what happened to me. Here's how I treated on my tax return. What do you think effectively? You basically automatically, I'm not gonna say you automatically trigger an audit, but you automatically trigger a review from a live agent who's gonna review your tax return and say, no, I don't agree, or yes, I agree. The, that's the downside. Someone's gonna look at your tax return. The benefit is that if they disagree with you, you avoid penalties and interest for um, misstating your tax taxes. If you'd have to just pay your taxes and then potentially pay a little bit of late payment penalties and interest, but nothing about um, fraudulent or um, you know anything like that. You avoid all these negligence penalties. So um, it's potentially beneficial. You have to look at it from your own right. Where you're saying, hey, this is too small. Where you know my risk on this is low, and I'm not going to do that. There's some folks that are are transacting big dollars where it might make a lot of sense because a percentage per of uh, penalties could be huge. So everyone's got to kind of look at that at their own level. You know, and then real fast, I just want to make sure some of these questions we covered in the chat, we got covered on this thing. Did uh, Yasin was trying to get in? Did Yasin ever get in? Does anybody know? I got it. Cassie, <laughs> I think you're the host. Oh. Okay, yeah. thank God. Sorry about that. Um, I think we answered. Got it. We answered the staking. Um, is it too late to apply for S Corp? I think we talked about that. So we're at Scam losses we just talked about. We're at the next one. Um, is mining revenue considered paying yourself a reasonable salary? No, it's actually got to be formal payroll in the form of a W-2. Um, and then got a few there's people one mining other one and nodes. They just passed. Um, so if you have an existing LLC escort, but it is not crypto related, would you put your crypto efforts inside that wallet? Once again, it's kind of, that's more of a legal perspective. From a tax standpoint, that's fine. Your bookkeeping, you just have to make sure you keep your reasonable books. And then the taxation, you had the benefits of the S corporation. You just get into the part where the reason why an LLC S corp is set up is for the limited liability where if something were to happen to your company and you get sued, they can go after the assets of the company, not of your, your personal assets. So if your crypto's in there, they potentially go after that. So depending on what you're doing and your risk tolerance, maybe, um, I would recommend setting up a separate one though, LLC or S corp just for the crypto, but you know, everyone's got their own reasons to, to combine them. <laughs> yeah. We got a question. I, know, great, I, great I, point. I don't know how many other people have already in have their family businesses or own family businesses. I grew up in one since uh, we started it in the sixties. So, I mean, we're kind of transitioning over. I've been listening to Michael Saylor a lot. The guy is just way ahead of everybody else when it comes to create like a treasury for his business, which is what I want to do. I don't know necessarily that I'm going to still be doing our same family business later on, but I did want to kind of convert what we have existing over to accepting Bitcoin and creating like a treasury that we can borrow against as an asset for our business. So I can create more debt that can't be taxed through my crypto. So there hasn't been really anybody that I've talked to around here as far as uh, CPAs or anything like that. They're very standoffish. Don't want to talk about it. They're like, no, 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 we don't mess with that. Don't talk about that around here. We don't talk about that around our office. So in order to even do anything close to what Micro Saylor is doing, you know, businesses like mine or anybody that's kind of planning to do something like that have no idea even where to start with it. Because if there's nobody that's of my side, I mean, we're a small business, mom and pop place, but we already have an existing LLC, S Corp, as a matter of fact. But how do we go about taking the steps to kind of move in that direction? So if I do start growing my business, I can offer that as like a 401k in place of, you know, we'll use Bitcoin as our you know, 401k instead of something like a regular traditional 401k. This might, so I, this might yeah, be a, get started. Sounds like he like needs to hire you guys. <laughs> for, for yeah, this, this one actually might be directed IRA. This might be Matt Sorensen, right? if I'm understanding this right. What do you think, Sean? Yeah, so um, there's definitely opportunities to keep 
cryptocurrencies within your business. So I'm not, when I was saying set up a separate LLC or an S corporation, um, I'm not saying that don't accept cryptocurrency into your business, but uh, if you have separate operations, mining and nodes, it may not be worth it. But if you want to have them combine and create some a treasury and whatnot and have other opportunities like that, um, you know, it's, it's great. The crypto space is creating opportunities that we never even thought we could have. So yeah, these self-directed IRAs may be a, a good idea. And um, we were at a uh, conference with Jeff and they were talking a lot on those. So we'd be happy to, to connect later and talk a little bit more specific about that, your situation. Oh, yeah. we could, um, a lot of questions that I haven't been able to answer. I've been in space since 17 and I've started to realize just, I mean, even the, the, the blockchain and what you could use in your business, how you can utilize the blockchain to protect your business in and of itself, aside from Bitcoin, and all the different uses of it. I've just been listening a lot to Michael Saylor and thinking, I mean, people would be stupid if they wouldn't do this. I don't understand why there's, I mean, thankfully there's not, but I mean, because we're kind of all on the leading edge of all that stuff, but just to try to understand how the IRS works. And it's like you said, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. It, it could be good and bad. You know, we can they leave the, the law so big that they can interpret it how they want it, but that kind of maybe plays towards us a little bit in the positive that we can maybe we can get a good enough lawyer, we can kind of use it to our advantage, you know, because if the law is not written very clearly, then how can they really adjudicate the law very specifically when it's written so big? You know what I mean? So right. There's really not, and there's not a lot of people like you guys out there that offer any help for businesses like us that have been around for 50 years that kind of want to modernize our operation and kind of bring, because it's all about gaining more Bitcoin. That's the only reason why I thought about starting to accept Bitcoin because we do have a cash part of our business as a way to gain, earn more Bitcoin instead of going out there and buying it all the time, you know, with, but then again, to creating that asset of a treasury, if we do grow our business so that people can invest in that and get my employees to start buying Bitcoin through me, which the company again is amassing more Bitcoin. It's, I guess it's just kind of a Michael Saylor type thing, but being protected also from the IRS personally and on the business side. No, it's very, very interesting. And like you said, I mean, it, there's really no precedent set, set. So it's really, we're, you know, we're starting to pave the ways and there's going to be the IRS and Congress and they're going to challenge things um, and precedent will be set. But like you said, if you could lay the the, found, or the foundation for it and, you know, we have a, a basis for doing it, it, you know, we potentially are laying the found, foundation for, you know, everyone to do the same thing. So no, we'd be happy to have a further conversation on that. Absolutely. And a personal IRA is a big thing where I need to start before we have a further conversation. I'm sorry? Oh, do you say a place to start before we can discuss further? It's like a personal IRA investment? Yeah, potentially. Uh, I mean, this one, uh, there are people are already doing it. So there's these self-directed IRAs where you're able to uh, invest in crypto and it's a Roth. So then you are buying your cryptocurrencies within there and then they're growing tax-free until you know, you're able to take them out later. And they have the same tax effect as a regular Roth, where after your 59 and a half, you could take it all out tax-free at any point you want. So um, that's, a, that's a place to look to just start, but it's a little bit different than what you were talking about. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. How is taxes done on like multi-signature wallets? Like who owns it? I mean, do we all have to pay the same amount of tax on it to make a transaction with it? Or what if I was the one who authorized the transaction? I like one, two out of the three or something. Or if we transfer money from a multi-sig wallet to another multi-sig wallet that we both don't entirely own. Or someone in the multi-sig wallet from a foreign country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> well, well transfers, transfers between wallets, not taxable, right, Sean? Right. But so I think what you're talking, so like if you're in a, if you have a wallet where you work, you know, maybe three people, but you guys are sharing funds, um, but you maybe didn't want to do one particular one. So it's just the funds of two other folks who are invested in one project is not really you. So what sounds like to me, I mean, if you don't have a formal LLC or anything like that set up, you have somewhat of a general partnership going, um, or at the very least, you guys are a bunch of sole proprietors uh, operating a business together. So you guys would have to allocate the fund, the income to each other. Um, so there's really no issue with that. Like, you, you could set up a partnership together without actually having an LLC um, set up but a general partnership doesn't get any liability protections. And then also you don't get the tax savings of an S corporation, but in that, this particular case, that may be the best route because then you could allocate the income, however. So if in project one, all three of you are in and it makes 300 bucks, you all allocated three or a hundred dollars each. But if in project two, you didn't get in and the other two were like, all right, we used our money. We made a thousand bucks. They both get allocated $500 on the 
pay tax earnings, you don't get allocated any of it. So you don't have to pay tax on their, their money. So you'd have to do it something like that, where the bookkeeping on it would be key in allocating the income from each particular project, knowing who put money in and how much to especially allocate that income all separately. Um, so if you're not working with a CPA or accountant, I recommend you do on that one. That, that one's a little bit more difficult than just trading the particular cryptos on their own. You know, and let me let me throw <clears throat> excuse me let me throw this out there too just in case we run short on time um feel free to email us your questions we're in the tax season just started for us so it may take quite a while to, to answer your question but we'll do the best we can and then if you actually need our services feel free to email us as well there's um there's a bit of a process that we have when we get just set up and onboarded on this thing but if you're interested in getting an entity and being an S-Corp and understanding the ins and outs of that, feel free to give us a ring. So for that formal process, it would be an email to info at wojco, which is W-O-J-C-O.com. And we'll get that info to Jeff and he could send that around. And if you need to talk to uh, Sean or myself, it's Sean, S-E-E-A-N at wojco.com. And for me, it's Chris at wojco.com. So happy to field any questions. Just have a lot of patience with us. <clears throat> Uh, Gary, go ahead. Uh, so you, you may have uh, answered a question uh, previously, but I, I want to be clear on it. So if you take on a uh, loan using your crypto as collateral, send it from your wallet to the uh, wallet of the loan company, that would be considered a wallet to wallet transfer and not taxable. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. So. So, say I want to get a fiat loan based off my crypto as collateral, and I have to send that crypto to that company, and they they hold it, and then they give me fiat return as a loan. And yep, they make yeah, no, that wouldn't be a taxable transaction. Okay, so they, uh, if you transferred it to their wallet, say uh, said, you know, 10 ETH, and uh, send it into their, their own wallet, and they said, no, we got we to gotta exchange that into USDT, is that taxable within their wallet? They have to exchange it. Yeah. Well, no, they asked. No, so I sent them ETH, and they said, "Now you got to convert it into USDT." Oh. Right. Um, yeah. Once you're exchanging crypto, at least the way that everyone, the IRS is treating everything right now, they would they would treat that as a taxable event in itself. Even if it's loan collateral, you'll get it back. Yeah. So the problem is that you know you could have taken. Um, you know, say you bought a thousand dollars of ETH back in the day, and now it's worth fifty, and you want to get a loan. You're going to convert that fifty thousand dollars into um, UST, um, and what you're able to get a loan for fifty thousand dollars now. So they probably wouldn't have been able to get you just if you you know collateralized your your ETH, just because you weren't exchanging or doing any of these particular uh, buzzwords that they look for. So sell, exchange are the big words that they're looking for. But once you exchange for your, U.S. Tether or anything like that, um, they're gonna they're gonna want to see the tax on that. Um, I get paid in a voucher, which is equal to one dollar. It's a reward. It's on a referral based system uh, for crypto. We have that kind of like finance, and uh, it goes onto a gift card or it's hard, and I can use it freely wherever they take Visa. Now, would that be a taxable item? I get paid. So the beginning part, you're getting paid for a service. Is that what I heard? I, I earned Station. Sure gets, referring people to a crypto to get buy the crypto, and in return, yeah, she gets paid a reward for referring people to crypto. That reward is a voucher. It's put into a like a debit card, and she uses that to purchase goods. Is that considered a taxable? Got it. Yeah. Um, well, so here's the thing. So even if the, so the reward, so it's, I'm thinking sort of like a Coinbase fee or something like that, where you, you know, you do like a referral fee like that is what I'm assuming what's going on here. Um, it'd be interesting because it potentially you could look at it the same way, the rewards from the, the uh, credit cards where it's non-taxable, but then you'd run into the issue is once you go and buy something, you exchange it for something else. You've exchanged something that you didn't pay tax on. So you have zero basis in, um, for, you know, say it was $5 worth of, of groceries, you'd have five, $5 of income from that reward because you exchanged something, a cryptocurrency for 
um, you know, another piece of property or, you know, the groceries at that point. So on the front end, it seems like, no, it wouldn't be. But once you start exchanging, then you run into the same issue. Well, the IRS is going to look for their tax once you sell or exchange. And Sean, if I was an IRS guy, I would take that argument a step farther, just based on those facts and circumstances. And I would say it's compensation. You're like a salesperson that received a commission on this thing. So if that was anybody else, you work for a car dealer and you sold the car and they pay you a commission, it's ordinary income, just like a, a W-2 would be, but maybe you'd get a 1099. And I also offered it, you may even owe self-employment tax on top of that. So it's really a facts and circumstances test. Yeah, and once again, I mean, everyone, you know, the IRS doesn't have set guidelines on a lot of it. So we're, we're kind of paving the way. So you got to kind of look at it from a risk tolerance standpoint, take a position. And then if the IRS, but when they eventually get some ironclad uh, rules put together or rev, rev proc or whatnot, then we'd have to go back and amend if we didn't take this position. So, um, you know, at the, po the point, I at some point, there's going to be a taxable event there, though, in my opinion just in that, that string of line. So it could either be on the front end, which would be the worst case scenario, like Chris is saying, where you potentially owe self-employment tax on it. Or even if you were able to somewhat attribute it more to like a credit card reward, then you're going to be paying taxes when you exchange. So um, I, I would not look at that as a non-taxable transaction all the way through. We've got a couple more questions, but we want to be respectful of your time because um, you guys are, uh, you know, uh, helping us out here. But uh, is there a hard stop for you guys? Because I, I know it's past the, the time that we allotted for you guys, but. Sure, no, we, we can take a few more questions for sure. A couple um, more questions, uh, go ahead. Um, for anybody that may have just been holding coins for the long term um, already, are you guys recommending any kind of like jurisdictional diversification or anything international wise, or is just cold storage hodling basically what you're recommending? Sure. So what, you, what a lot of people are, you know, you, what you may have heard of is like, hey, you go, um, you know, you got particular places like Puerto Rico, where if you set up a business down there, you pay 4% corporate tax and 0% personal tax. Um, but the IRS in this particular situation, they're going to look at it and say, hey, you had all this appreciation on U.S. soil. So you got to pay tax here. Um, and then any appreciation in the other uh, jurisdiction, you, you could pay tax to them at that point. But the IRS is going to look at it from this particular stance that you earned all this while you're, you were a U.S. or living in the U.S. or even had the, the crypto here. Um, so as far as moving it to other jurisdictions, uh, um, I haven't seen a lot of successful strategies around that. Um, but Chris, I don't know if you have anything to add there. No, no. Well, well said. And then probably something to add, just more of the murkiness and the clarity from the IRS is if, if you have a, a foreign bank account, um, and it's greater than $10,000 at any time during the year, you're supposed to file with your tax return an FBAR report. You know, they're looking for offshore accounts, money laundering, uh, prevention of terrorism, stuff like that. So it's unclear where, where crypto is located in a lot of cases. We get Singapore as an answer all the time, which would be offshore. And if you had more than 10,000 of crypto, you know, do you get a file an FBAR report? Right now, there is a frequently asked question on the IRS website where they're, they're saying no, but it's not out of the question. So there might be something forthcoming. So these jurisdictional issues get real interesting and go back to setting up your entity. And the question was posed about Wyoming and Nevada and Texas, very crypto friendly states. But there's really not states that are anti-crypto or not crypto friendly. And our default answer just for United States purposes, is if you do set up an entity, we recommend setting it up in the state you reside in. It's probably the best thing to do because that's probably going to be the default. It's called CITIS and the, the IRS and the law tends to go to CITIS where you where you reside on things. So I just wanted to offer that real fast. You guys you guys recommend a terrible uh, CRT, terrible reminder trust? Is that something you guys sure. do? Um, we have, we're, we're part law firm. And then we do simple estate planning, and then we have some alliances with uh, more vigorous estate planners on this thing. So we could certainly set up a charitable remainder trust, and it's a uh, it's a great idea in regard to crypto. If you're going to grow your crypto business, a whole other topic. To yeah, talk and about. a lot of it's facts and facts and circumstances too. I mean, how, what what do you want to happen with your assets when you're, you know, you eventually pass and all that? And the charitable remainder trust could be a great fit for some folks, and other people may not like the whole thing about it. But it's definitely 
once again, these are definitely great topics to be looking into as you guys get into the field or as you continue to grow your, your assets. Uh, how do uh, taxes work with DAOs? Taxes with DAOs, how does that work? So that's the, you know, with the staking, um, you know, if that gets passed and somehow gets to wrapped in the, the DAOs, you may get into a situation where it's non-taxed until you pull that money out and then either exchange for another crypto or um, sell it for fiat. Um, but right now, to date, you know, everyone was in the CPA community. So anyone that, you know, we've talked to that's involved in the space, um, the guidance that we had, we're looking at that as every time that you received a reward or a rebase, um, you would recognize ordinary income, which would be tough to nearly impossible to, uh, to track. So you're going to have to come, come up with some sort of reasonable method of accounting there, um, whether it be manually or some of these softwares end up working on it. Um, but, um, you know, with this court case going out there, um, you, you may be able to make the argument that it's non-taxable depending on the, the nature of what your particular DAO is doing. So each one does, you know, has a different function. So, you know, if you're looking at it and you're creating new property and it's, you know, that's what's happening for you, then you could try to take the argument that it's non-taxable, but you, you're going to have to get ready to potentially amend your return later if the IRS comes back and uh, fights that particular stance on the DAO. So, um, you know, they, you may be able to wrap the staking argument into the DAOs as well. So it's something to look into. The, the conservative approach is that it's ordinary income when it hits your wallet. Um, the aggressive approach, potentially more correct at this point, just given that case, is that it's non-taxable until you sell it. So once again, there's no set rule on it right now or, or regulation. So, um, you know, you got to have a discussion with your CPA and talk about your risk tolerance and take the best approach for you. Yeah, it's a consideration with the last question I asked about a multi-sig wallet. Just make sure I understand. So if you have like a group of friends, like three friends that have like a multi-sig, let's say Bitcoin wallet or something and a multi-sig, like another wallet, another cryptocurrency. Um, and you guys like, you know, would do a swap, like you both, two of the people in the friendship agree to send the money to another wallet, you know, because I think it's more profitable. How would you declare that as like on your individual taxes as like um, potential like a taxable event? Who owns the crypto? If I didn't authorize it, do I have to declare it? Or people declare it, how much do they own one third? Technically, if you have a majority vote, it's still all or nothing. Right. So it's, it's how, a partnership. Do partnership, no. Gotcha. Yeah. So um, the easiest way and would and it may not sound easier to you, but would be to actually have a general partnership or eventually saying, but I'll see where these are assets of the business. And then as you're transferring money between the wallets, there's no taxable event. But as income and expenses are generated they would be specially allocated to each of the owners. So what would happen is this part, tech, you know, if there's a particular transaction that costs you guys 500 bucks, that was only two of you guys making the move, then that would get allocated to those two at the end of the year. And at the throughout the year, these, these transactions would accumulate and say, you know, even if there was $10,000 of income, it wouldn't get split a third, a third, a third. You know, there could be projects where one of you guys lost money and then the other two were on this other project that did really well. So, one of, one of the K1s could show a loss while the other two show income. But if you don't want to go that route, I mean, you could try to con, uh, assign the income potentially on an individual tax returns, just saying that I own a, you know, a third of this wallet and my share of income is this. The problem is that you know if the IRS tries to look into the, the wallets, they're going to see it in three different spots and they're, they're going to have trouble trying to track it down, make sure no one's cheating the IRS on the thing. So you just have to make sure that you're the, the accounting on that's going to be key because it's not going to be 100% either of you guys or any of you guys. So just sticking it in a, a coin tracker or a coin lead or anything like that like isn't going to get the job done just because you guys are going to have to look at each particular one and allocate the particular set of income to uh, whoever was, you know, recognizing that transaction. Just saying having a non-formal like uh, multi-sig wallet with someone is like, it's kind of gray legally or because the fact the ownership is still not it's not a formal you know, contract. You don't really say who owns it. And especially right. it depends on how people are allowed for most people as we actually go through. It could be two out of a group of hundred technically. So, well, that's the that's the thing too, is when you look at these wallets, there's different ones. So like Coinbase doesn't know your customer. So they know who put the money in. So they have to report to the IRS. This guy set up an account, he put X amount in and he sent it to wherever. 
So now the IRS knows the money's in play from whoever that individual was. It could be one of you guys, could be all three of you. But then you get into different wallets like MetaMask wallet or something like that. There's no know your customer. The IRS doesn't know whose wallet that is. So like you said, they're not going to know. So it's all about, you know, self-reporting on this thing to make sure you don't get in a pickle later. So you guys got to, you look at it and assuming you guys want to report your taxes, obviously no one wants to pay more taxes than they have to, but if you can come up with a reasonable method and beat it down however you legally can and pay your, your fair share, you pay your taxes. And if the IRS comes in later and says, hey, how did you guys report this? And you either report it all individually in your tax returns, that would be one way to do it. Or you could set up, you could file an actual form 1065, a general partnership where, um, you know, you report all the income there and then allocate the, the profit to each of you based on, you know, the accounting on it. So there's a little bit more there. So yeah, there's really no way for the IRS to know, but they'll figure it out eventually by, you know, if you ever get audited, whoever put the money in through Coinbase or whichever one of these exchanges that the IRS or that your social security numbers are tied to, they can figure out that you are, you're cheating them. Then there's, that's the way they're going to do it. They're going to go through Coinbase and they're just going to follow the money because it's all on those public wallets. And then they're going to, you know, find a way. I mean, I don't know how exactly you're going to do it right now. There's no one to subpoena really on the MetaMask side of things, but eventually I, I figure they'll find a way. So there's risk to not reporting. So from your standpoint, it's just coming up with a reasonable method of accounting and allocating the income appropriately. And again, remember the burden of proof is on the taxpayer. Yeah, sure. All right, one, one last question. Anybody have one last question? Okay, I'll see if you have any recommendations on tax or coin panda, or do you do something yourselves or do you recommend your customers do something like that? Recommendation on the tracking? Is that what that was? Yeah, like, like TaxBit or Coin Panda, one of the services that. Sure. Um, we, I mean, we've heard great things about a lot of them. The particular one we've been keen on in the last week was Coinly. We like that one. Um, it seems to work well. Um, gives a nice little balance of all your assets at the end of the year. So it helps create a balance sheet for your, um, you know, if you are having an S corporation, you're not just reporting your income. You have to report a balance sheet. So show your assets, your liabilities, and your equity. Um, but um, yeah, we like Coinly, but I've heard good things about Coin Panda. Some people like Coin Tracker and TaxBit as well. So they've come highly recommended. I think either way, there's going to be some, you know, you're not just going to be able to import it into your, um, import all your wallets and then um, have it just automatically do it correctly. You're, there's going to be some manual entries that you got to go in, correct some tagging, some things it doesn't pull in correctly. So, so for some of the nodes, like, so from personal experience, we have a couple of strong nodes. So when we were importing our transactions into Coinly, um it's um you know when you claim the rewards we were claiming 10 strong at a time and for whatever reason on the, the blockchain it was you know collecting 2.23 strong plus another 2.2 plus another 2.2 and some of them ended up being the same exact number with the same exact um hash or whatnot so the software thought it was doubling up so it didn't pick it in so pick it up so i had to go in there and manually adjust so there's gonna you're gonna have to do that with whatever software that you go with um, but, uh, you know, those, any of those four that seem to be the ones that are coming to, to light for us. We've seen a lot of our clients who have tried all four go to Coinly, but you know, there's other folks that like coin tracker better. Right. So take, take yeah. a look at Jeff Bezos, uh, question. <laughs> uh, if I coordinate a crypto scam, how do I file my taxes? Can I still claim deductibles? <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, so, Chris, you have any last words? Uh, maybe how, you already set out to contact you guys. We'll share with everybody here and also uh, everybody watching your information. Are you guys accepting clients or I know it's, it's kind of crazy right now with, with tax season. No, we, we are accepting clients. Just have a bit of patience. The other thing we're doing, too, is we're also recommending that everybody extend now real fast on extensions. To get an extension, you have to pay, you get it, it's an extension of time to file, but not an extension of time to pay the tax. So business returns are due March 15th, typically. Individual return returns April 15th. The reason we're recommending extensions is this law is unsettled. We got the Build Back Better Act, it might pass. So rather than have to go back and amend returns, we'd rather, we'd rather have a good draft of the return on extension date, have you paying the appropriate amount of tax, and then, uh, uh, actually finish these up and file them when the extended due dates come around, which are September 15th and October 15th. And there might be a little bit more clarity in the law. 
Um, yeah, I'm just we're, trying to let you, yeah. Yeah, we're certainly accepting clients. So the process I would do, and it seems to have worked, um, because we've had a few discussions like this, where we like this, where we have a bunch of people coming at one time, and once again, like Chris said, just have patience. We're going to set up calls with um, one of our staff CPAs, and then they'll give you the introduction of a little bit more about the firm. They could talk more specific about your particular situation um, and any particular questions that you have that we didn't get answered today um, as in an intro call. And then what we do is we email you a proposal that lays out here's what we're going to do, here's what the fees would be. Um, and then you, you green light us and we send an engagement letter and then we're, then we're rolling. So, um, the sooner, the better, just because we are getting very quickly towards some of these deadlines where it's going to get very, we're going to become tight on time, just on the, our existing clients. And we want to give you guys your fair share of time as well. But, you know, the closer we come in on like March 15th, it's going to be really tough to, to fit a lot of people in. So if you guys have interest, we're happy to have those discussions, get the information to you as soon as possible. So you can make the decision on your end, whether or not it makes sense to go with us or not. So. I would email, I, I put it in the Zoom chat, Jeff. So if you want to provide it to anyone there, I mean, it's just info at wojco.com is the email address to reach out to and just mention, hey, I can't, I was part of the uh, crypto world call. I'm interested to talk, talking with your team. And then um, it'll likely be Gina Mitchell from our off office who will get back to you um, and setting up a time to talk with one of our uh, CPAs. All right, guys, we, we really appreciate the time you've taken to talk to uh you know, our crypto over coffee. We do this weekly. It's always great having you get, you know, having folks like you that, that have, you know, expertise in, in this space. Um, looking to, to have uh, uh, more calls with you guys to bring you more clients because you guys are definitely a, a value um, as we open up more locations. But thank you so much. And we'll, we'll stay in contact along the ways. We'll talk for you. Yeah. Great. Thanks. No, thank you for having us. We're, we're honored to be on here, part of the crypto space. It's a, it's an exciting field and we're, we're just happy to be part of it. So thanks yeah, for having us. I will be in Miami for that next tax summit. But... Exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Love it. All Bye right, everybody. Man. Have a great day. Thank you. Right, have, Thank a, you. have a good one.